I think mostly it's a mindset thing. Sometimes it's exposure to the actual possibility that you don't have to be stuck there forever. So most of us interact with the 99% who aren't in the 1%. That's literally how math works. And so our financial advice, our life structure advice is coming from people who didn't achieve financial freedom, who didn't escape that rat race, middle life uh, uh, lifestyle trap that gets most people. And I say most people, it's a majority of people. <laughs> and some of these are pretty straightforward concepts that I think uh, once you look at them through a new light, you can think, okay, yeah, a little adjustment there um, can make a big difference in your life. And some of the things I'm going to mention tend to bring out the haters. So those won't come up in the first few minutes. Haters have to wait. Uh, and I'm not going to say something like uh, Dave Ramsey has a, a debt aversion and Kiyosaki has a romance with debt. So you need to find a blend, blended version that works for you. I'm actually just going to talk about the simple mindsets that people have, the way of looking at things like money that make it to where that person is never going to have money that comes in that you don't have to work for. Even that concept. Most people think money is what you get in exchange for goods and services. And when it comes to us, that means exchanging our time for money. That's why almost any time you ask somebody what they do and how much they make, they're going to give you a monthly, quarterly, yearly, or hourly rate for what they make. And a person trapped in that mindset will always be limited by their time to make money. And uh, the reason I bring up the uh, Dave Ramsey and Robert Kiyosaki is some of the things that I don't like uh, are from both schools of thought. And so I don't want to feel like I'm attacking either one because when it comes to reaching financial freedom, making work optional, there is no one right way. You need to find a way that works for you. And so of the things I'm going to list, not all of them are going to apply to you, but a couple might and a couple simple shifts in the way you look at money the way you look at income, the way you look at finances in its entirety could have a huge impact on your journey. And one of the first ones is if you, if you see somebody trapped in the middle class, and what I mean by this, the one, why I call it trapped is the average person in the middle class isn't going to have a high likelihood of being able to retire at even what is considered a regular retirement age. That would, right now it's 65 years old. Uh, in France or uh, uh, in uh, some other countries, there, there are kind of protests going on because the government is trying to change or just changed the age of retirement from 62 to 64. And so the first thing to mention when it comes to the middle class mindset is when we think of retirement, this is the thing that kind of keeps people trapped there is you can't retire until a certain age. And if you could just shift that first thought to, I can retire when I have a certain amount of income that I don't have to work for, right? So instead of thinking how old, we can think how much, right? So that's the first mental shift to think of, that retirement happens when we have enough income. So for the people stuck in the how old phase, they are thinking social security, access to retirement accounts, pensions based on something like how long you worked for a company, agency, municipality, or government agency, and your age combined together equal a certain age so that you can use, you can utilize that pension retirement. Get away from thinking age and think how much. The second thing, and this is, maybe I'm starting early with one of the things that might kind of piss a few people off. The middle class mindset is I want to pay off my house. And here's why it's going to irritate people because of the, the language I'm going to use. And uh, I've, I've used this language a couple of times in conversations with people. And so I want to be honest, like I'm talking to you specifically, the person who is sitting there thinking, I'd really like to have my house paid off, okay? And this is why you might be offended by what I'm about to say. That is an extremely childish way of looking at things. The middle-class mindset thinks of ownership. If my house is paid off, I owned it. I own, own that house. I own the thing that is not able to produce income while I'm living in it. Why would you want to own something that doesn't produce income? Versus... That here's a mental shift. Remember, it's not that paying off your house is a bad thing, but instead of looking at paying off your house, look at your overall equity position. How much equity do you own? Would you rather have a $100,000 home paid off 
or a $400,000 home with $300,000 in debt. Now, if those were rentals, the $100,000 home is only going to appreciate based on the $100,000 that you've paid off. This is if you live there too. The $400,000 property is going to appreciate based on the value of the property, which includes the debt because the bank doesn't get the appreciation. The owner does. The $400,000 property as a rental, even if you live there, is experiencing principal pay down. So your equity position continues to grow after the $100,000 would be paid off. There are several ways of thinking, and that's just the first step. The second step, which is a, a little bit harder to, to, to get the mind around or to put into words that are understandable, the money that you're using to pay off your mortgage, which is, in most cases, because debt is on a scale, bad debt, good debt, worse debt, better debt. Good debt is debt that makes more money than it costs you to own. It's fixed rate debt, so you can't be, uh, you can't have the interest rate sneak up on you. And generally, someone else is going to pay it off. But the place that you live in, and this is where house hacking, or buying a house with an ADU, a duplex, a triplex, a fourplex, with that fixed rate debt, this is one of the benefits to the place that you live not being paid off. You're going to get the best interest rate if it's owner occupied, because to the lenders, this is the least risky type of loan. Because you live there, you're less likely to give up that property. So you're focusing on paying off fixed rate debt that has the best interest rate on investment properties that you can get. That's a huge mistake. <clears throat> then there's the middle class mindset that I actually got from my dad, who wasn't middle class. I would consider him below poor most of his entire life. If, if you're familiar with my content, you've heard me talk about uh, when I was a kid, we never actually owned or rented anywhere. We would just move into houses, fix the doors and windows, wait for the owners to find us, and then we would move. And there was a point in time where one of the owners offered my dad $50 a month in rent to stay there because they were happy that there was someone living there because it was less likely the place was going to get trashed or the pipes were going to get stolen because while we were there occupying it, it was safer for the owner. And $50 a month was too much for my dad. So we moved to the next place. But this was a concept that my dad really drilled into my brothers. And for one, it paid off. For one, it's still kind of a challenge. And for me, um, it really kind of had a huge impact on my level of laziness. But a lot of us, when we're stuck in that middle-class mindset, we are taught, we're trained from a young age. Remember, if you really want to indoctrinate something into somebody, you get that to them at a young age, was that hard work is rewarded. Michael Zuber talks about this a lot in his book, One Rental at a Time. He, you know, he loves his mom. She watches his content. So he tries to be very careful that he's not insulting her. But he says she used to drop him off at school and say, work really hard, get really good grades. So you can get a good job and you can earn a lot of money and buy a lot of things. Work really hard and get good grades. That mean nothing when it comes to finances. Work really hard to be rewarded which means nothing when it comes to finances. If hard work was what was rewarded, the coal miners, the tree trimmers, those, those jobs that are very physically demanding would be the highest paid people that there are. Hard work is not rewarded. High impact is rewarded. So if we can find ways to be compensated for the uh, problems that we solve instead of the time that we commit or the sweat labor that we put into something to... It's kind of counterintuitive, but get away from the idea that hard work is rewarded. Working hard towards a goal is rewarded, but just work hard, you'll be rewarded is a mindset that keeps a lot of people in a job, sometimes that they hate, but you get this mental image that it sucks so much, I must be rewarded for working here. And when we're not, we're angry at the government for taxing us because income is, you know, that you work for is taxed the highest. We're angry at the employer for not paying us more. Well, Hard work, especially sometimes when it doesn't take the skill level of other jobs, is easier to replace. So you're not compensated very much because you don't have much impact, no matter how much harder you work than the person next to you. Here's a, here's a concept that uh, the middle class really has. And, and I see this, com this comment pop up all the time in social media in the finance groups. So this is the, even the educated people trying to be educated. I see this question. How much do you have saved for retirement? 
if you continue to save, you will almost guaranteedly, guaranteedly, neither one of those is a word, you are almost guaranteed to never become wealthy and always have to work for money or have a very frugal, almost unhealthy life when you do retire at that age bracket where social security, retirement accounts, and pensions can kick in if you have one of those. Saving will not make you wealthy, no matter how much you save. Uh, Forbes just came out with a, or, or it was Wall Street Journal or one of those things that I don't read, but Joe Rogan was talking about. Um, an article came out where it takes about $3 million to retire comfortably now if you save it up. The average person, do, do how many people of the average income with the average living expenses are going to be able to actually save $3 million over their working career versus I've invested about $320,000 of my own money and Obviously, Mike missed my message. <laughs> uh, it produces a little over $200,000 a year in income that I can live on and retire early on and not have to save that $3 million it takes to retire. So just to give you a bit of an intro here, Mike, I know you were picking up your kid and jumping in late. I am going over uh, middle-class mindsets okay. that keep you chopped. So you're going to sum up after with ones that, that I might have missed. So that gets your head thinking. So when someone asks you, how much do you have saved for retirement? Maybe shift the, com the topic to what are you investing in? What is the yield? And how much do you think you're going to have to invest to reach that cash flow that you need to be financially independent, whether retiring early or working until an older age because you love your job and it might be, you might need the activity. Doesn't mean you have to retire. It's just an option. Most people that I know that are stuck in that middle-class mindset that can't escape the rat race that are going to probably work until they die. And uh, they have this concept. Actually, I've had family members tell me this before too, like they had this, this epiphany that one day, it's not how much you can afford to spend when you're buying an item. It is, can you afford the payments? They would look at the items or the, the house or the car or the, the RV or the boat or the trip or the credit card. And they wouldn't think, okay, how much am I overall spending for whatever I'm looking at? It's every month, if I buy this thing, this is what the payments will be. If I use the payment stacked with the other payments that I have versus my income, these are how many more things that I can buy. When we purchase something, it's always best to look at the overall cost of something. If you buy a car, and your payment is $350 a month, you might be able to afford that. But if you're buying a car in payments, now you have to have the highest level of insurance, which raises that cost. You have registration, you have maintenance, you have all of the expenses that go into what it takes to have that car payment. So the overall cost isn't even just what that thing costs you, but every other expense that can be tied to it. So don't look at payments, look at the cost. This is a mistake that I actually was pretty uh, guilty of myself. When I Actually, when I started investing, this was one of the biggest problems that I had. Most people in the middle class will not take the time to educate themselves on finances. One of the traps of the middle class is really being into education. Traditional, your grades in high school matter, your college degree matters. And, but so education is very important unless it comes to finances. So they'll do what I consider to, and this is again, one of those things that's gonna piss some people off and, and why I didn't start the video in the first 30 seconds with it. They'll do something extremely stupid like hire a financial planner who benefits from the programs that they convince you to invest in. So their management fees over the course it takes you to save or, and invest for retirement can be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars but it's only one or half a percent. So it doesn't seem like a lot. And that person doesn't have your assets, doesn't have your goals, doesn't have your timeline. I've even had somebody that I would have called a mentor that invests in real estate, that had 30 rentals, reached financial freedom, had a brokerage with 19 agents working for him. And I thought this guy is doing what I want to do. He'd be the perfect mentor. And the things that he would have had me investing and making offers on in the first couple of months of learning how to invest, if I had gotten any of those offers, I would have went bankrupt. Because he didn't have my goals. He'd never invested in the specific asset class. He'd never, he'd never invested with mortgages. He'd never invested in small multifamily. So even somebody that targeted on what I wanted to do would have been a bad mentor. We need to take charge and educate ourselves. Things like YouTube videos, podcasts, audiobooks, uh, going and interacting with other investors 
and not just one as a mentor, but all of the investors, especially in your local market or who invest in the market where you invest. REI meetups can be social media, can be Facebook groups. If you're like Mike, where you invest in another state, interacting with investors in that area is more important than anything somebody else can tell you what to do. You need to educate yourself. I actually lost money my first year because I wasn't educated. I wasn't taking in audiobooks or podcasts and educating myself. I was making all kinds of decisions that were wrong. So, so taxing the rich is the, hang on just a second. As I slowly cough myself to death here. Taxing the rich is something that also comes up in conversations when I talk to people about being trapped in the middle class. They think if we can just tax the rich instead of the middle class, then the middle class will have an easier chance of being more financially secure. But the problem is the people who don't make a lot of money generally don't pay taxes at all. Earned income credit, child tax credit, uh, all the social programs that are in existence like um, EBT, food stamps, Section 8, child daycare subsidies, all the way where taxes are funneled to people who don't make a lot of money. So they're not paying taxes. And the people who are making a significant amount of money are generally not doing it through their earned income because earned income is taxed the highest. So the, we have an, a tax incentive program, not a tax punishment program. People say, well, if you make more, they're going to punish you. Yes, if you're working for money like people in the middle class do, but the wealthy people are getting their income from things like capital gains, which has a lower cap on taxes, or passive income. And passive is the term that the IRS uses because investing in real estate is not exactly passive. It does take some a level of time. With me self-managing 16 units, it takes about two hours a month. I think with Mike, with his property manager managing his properties, it's probably still at least two hours a month to go through and make sure everything's done right. So it's not quite passive, but the IRS calls it that. But it's taxed basically for several years, possibly a couple of decades, at zero. Because the tax incentive program wants people to generate more housing, wants people to be entrepreneurial and create businesses to create jobs to help the economy. So the middle class person will say things like tax the rich and the rich always means anybody making more money than me to the person speaking. But the people that are making more money than the middle class are generally not doing it through their earned income. So taxing the rich always backfires and ends up being a higher tax on the rich. California, let's Let's make a mansion tax. What do they do? Well, they sell them and they move. Let's raise state income tax. Well, what do they do? Graham Stephan, smart move, moves to Las Vegas. No income state for the tax. Keeps making money, saves, what is it, 13% on his taxes every year for the state. The middle class person doesn't usually have the option to just move to another state and have the same or an increased level of income. Think of all the videos that Graham made when he moved to Vegas that generated an income because he was moving to Vegas. The last thing I'm going to wrap up for before I go, well, there's two things. I'll cover the first one that, that's not as irritating. One of the biggest mistakes that people in the middle class make, and a lot of poor people make this mistake too, but not as many. There's more middle class people that make this mistake. And that's having one source of income. If you fear losing your job because of a recession, that means your job's too important. You should be developing several sources of income. And when people talk about the average millionaire having seven sources of income, it doesn't mean that you have a job, a business, investments, stocks, and you're like, you're not diversified that way. Here's how I have more than one source of income. And currently, for the last almost a year now, none of this income comes from a W-2 job. Each one of my properties is more than 10 miles apart, close to several different economic drivers. And my properties are divided between Section 8, military or working or retired people. So I have a very well diversified portfolio of rentals and each one on its own is a source of income. If I had a 10 unit apartment complex in one area, I would consider that one source of income because some change in that area could impact all 10 of my units. Since mine are spread out, all duplexes and triplex and fourplex in different areas, each one can be impacted differently, but each one is a source of income. If you invest in dividend stocks, each dividend stock in a different sector. So if you invest all dividend stocks in tech, I would consider that one source of income. But if you have tech, you know, like AT&T, and then you have Coke, you know, Coca-Cola products, that's a, that's a different dividend source. So diversify your sources of income so you're not so tied into your job being that important.
And of course, my voice has to fail as soon as I start a live stream that I'm hoping lasts at least an hour or two. And here's the last thing I want to wrap up before I give it over to you, Mike, and I'll explain to anybody that's new to the channel who Mike is. This is the one that irritates everybody. I talked a little bit at the beginning of this, not everybody. This is the one that irritates people who um, are really vested in this. I talked about education being important and, and the people saying your grades matter. You know, Zuber's mom's dropping them off at school and saying, work really hard, get good grades, so you can get a good job, so you can make good a lot of money and buy a lot of things. Because things are what make us happy, right? Uh, so education is tied to success. And of all of the multi-millionaires that I know, I'm actually trying to go through my mind. I know Zuber has a degree in econ. I don't know that I know anybody else with a degree that is financially successful. There are a lot of people who are middle-class successful, big house, because that's a sign of success, big car, because that's a sign of success, a vacation every year on credit cards on the two weeks that they're allowed to take off, um, and mountains of debt that came with what it took to get that education. So there are some times when a college degree is tied to the type of work that you want to do. It can be accounting, medical, uh, legal, you know, something where it's literally tied to the income. So before in future land, somebody watches this and gets mad that I was talking about how education doesn't pay off. There are times that it does. There are times that it makes sense to have an LLC. It's not for the things people usually do. There are times it makes sense to get married. Neither one of us can see that anymore, but there are times where it does make sense. But for most people, that go and spend years, 40% of people who have more than $12,000 in, in uh, college loan uh, debt didn't get the degree, 40%. So not only did the degree not lead to better work if they got it, but they didn't get it and they have the debt. Lumberjack landlord didn't finish after the ninth grade, uh, makes more money than probably everybody that I know, but maybe three people that I'm actually, that I interact with. I've never been asked by any lender, by any um, vendor that provides services to see my grades or my degree. I actually had to hide my degree when I started getting into law enforcement. I, when I went and talked to, uh, I did ride-alongs with different departments and, they, and, they, and you talk to the officers and find out a little bit about that department. You spent eight hours with them on their shift. I found out that there was a town, Yelm, that liked an associate's degree, Thurston County liked an associate's degree, uh, but the town where I ended up going to, the chief didn't want to hire anybody with a degree. So if you talked about it, if it was your selling point, you were out of the running. It would have cost me the job if that was the thing that I talked about the most. They do ask you for your personal financial statement. If you get to the point where you don't have 10 loans in your name anymore and you're not using Fannie, Freddie, conventional loans, and you need to go to DSCR, asset-based loans, they're going to look for your personal financial statement which has nothing to do with education. So hopefully the things that I've listed out um, will at least get you thinking about finances a different way and make a small adjustment in the way that you think about money to get out of that middle-class mindset. Millennial Mike is here. Millennial Mike is uh, an investor who is reaching financial freedom, gonna be retiring here in a couple of years uh, so he can stop getting shot at in his current job. Uh, maybe spend a little more time with his son, uh, is house hacking in a high cost of living area, but invests at a distance in the Midwest and has pointed out a couple of times that a lot of people get excited about investing at a distance. And there is a couple of really good, strong strategies that you, you can use to do that successfully. And there are thousands of ways that you can throw away a bunch of money on bad deals in those markets. Uh, so if you haven't heard of him, you should definitely check him out here on YouTube, Millennial Mike, and on that um, Instagram thing that you keep trying to get me to be into. Mike, one day. thoughts on today. one day, but not today. Middle class mindset traps. You know, I would encourage everybody to watch the movie The Matrix. Uh, if you have never seen it, it's just a sci fi movie. But it's a great thought experiment. And I'm not asking you to watch it because it's got fantastic special effects. It did at the time, but they certainly don't, don't look great today. But the thought experiment is that we're trapped in a system that seems normal to everybody else. 
Everybody around us is stuck in the same system and nobody realizes it. No one has any idea that we are all stuck in here together. And then, of course, as the movie goes on, somebody figures it out and a couple of other people are trying to pull each other out of the matrix back to the real world. And so I like to say all the time that we're stuck in a financial matrix, because what is the cultural norm? What is it that we all consider regular standard operating procedure? You go to high school, you graduate high school, you go to college, you get into a whole bunch of debt to get your college degree, you graduate, you get a job, you stay with that company for the rest of your life. If you get a pension, you're lucky. If not, you invest into a 401k or a Roth IRA, you retire at 65, you work 40 years to live 11. Social Security and Roth IRA will hopefully take care of you in old age so that you can retire with dignity. That is the financial matrix. That's normal. And then there's the first layer of uh, making yourself feel better about it. Oh, hey, I follow Dave Ramsey. And so I'm investing into my Roth IRA and I'm investing into my 401k. I've got the company match and I've paid my house off. See, I'm one of the good lemmings. I'm one of the good matrix uh, patrons. I'm one of the good citizens of this fake reality. And so they'll, you'll kid yourself and lie to yourself and say, hey man, I think that I'm making it work. But at the end of the day, great, you got $2 million in your 401k. You can retire on seven or $8,000 a month. Fantastic. Your house is paid off. Biggest expense you got's gone. Good. You're doing a little bit better than some of the other slave minds still stuck in the matrix, but you're not winning. You're not living the life that you actually want. And you pushed off your goals and your dreams and your aspirations until your mid 60s or later. If you even live that long, a lot of people in our profession don't make it that long. And the joke is when you're a cop that we all retire and die within two years anyways. And so we're stuck in this financial matrix where we've just convinced ourselves or society or the combination of both that everything's okay, but it isn't okay. It is not okay. This is not the winning system. This is not the winning strategy. Dion is on vacation. He went to Gary with me. Now he's in Portugal. He's going to come back, do a quick drive-by so we can go to a speaking event in Portland. And he's off on another cruise, off on another vacation. And what the matrix will convince you is that the only way you can live that type of lifestyle is if you're a multi multi millionaire and you have so much expendable income. Well, really, that's actually not what it takes. You could just get investments. We chose real estate. And then over time, the amount of money that that investment generates will grow with inflation, inflation if you invested in the right thing. You can escape the matrix if you just stop accepting the fake reality that you've been spoon fed since you were a small child and instead put in the work and the effort and the struggle to set yourself up now so you can get out of the system early and then do what Dion does or as Neo in the matrix, turn around and free the minds of others. Remember, he's only offering us the truth, nothing more. Perfect analogy, I think. As long as it doesn't get you stuck on home arrest in Romania, you'll be fine. I see a couple of super chats here. Evo, thank you. I appreciate that for the sticker. Um, and of course, and you're from Chicago land. Nice. I actually went there for the second time as I passed through from my way to Gary. If, Mike, I miss any of the questions with these super chats, please let me know. Um, Tom, howdy. Thank you for the super chat following in our footsteps. We will get you there. We actually had a call with Tom, um, went really well. I think uh, it's got a great start. And there was a super chat from Adam. Howdy, appreciate the topic. Many of us need to hear it. One of the, one of the things that's kind of risky with doing a topic like this is this brings out the haters. Like even when alux.com does anything, you know, rich versus poor, rich versus middle-class, middle-class mindset, any, any of those kind of videos, there are hundreds of comments of people that it's my situation. There were things outside of my control. Like, you know, there, and there are some one-offs where maybe that's true. You have a health event at the wrong time in life and, and the other things can be out of there. You can be impacted by a divorce, which can make the next two to five years of your life pretty interesting when it comes to finances. But the majority of people don't have those one-off events that continuously last decades where you can't do something simple like instead of buying a house, buy a duplex. Or if you're renting, have roommates, reduce or eliminate that largest expense. Figure out a way to get income that doesn't come from you working at a W-2 job. Um, okay, make sure I didn't miss any questions there. Uh -oh. 
Aloha, financial fighter, firefighter. And I remember seeing one that said Dave was here first. Dave's not here, man. Um, still can't believe the lumberjack landlord didn't get that reference. Yeah. (laughs) Josh, howdy. Poor haters. It sucks for them to be wrong all of the time. (laughs) It would be impressive to be wrong all of the time. I mean, not everybody can be a crash bro. Eugene, howdy. From Belgium. Thank you for sharing your thoughts and ideas on gaining financial freedom. Freedom financially. That's that's kind of the goal here is to show people that it is possible. That um, while uh, Mike is funnier, taller, better looking than the average person, um, when it comes to things like finances, I think we're fairly average. We went through those beautiful divorces, became single parents with custody of our kids. Very very average positions to be in and to be able to work towards financial freedom. The average person can do this. When I started, I was only making $17 an hour. And everybody's like, well, I don't make enough money to do this. Well, that was, you know, 10 years ago, 11 years ago. It's no, it's just, it wasn't like it was in the 80s. Uh, I was still able to save, to tackle bad debt, and to make financial decisions that made the income snowball eventually start to reach financial freedom. No cats in palm trees today, but driving home from work, a cat did cause a guy to swerve off the road into a wall, pulled over to make sure he was okay. Nice. The, the, the rough life of the fireman in Hawaii. So, although Mark has been doing really well with, uh, kind of jumped in really quick, emptied out of retirement accounts, bought a bunch of rentals all at once. I think if I remember the numbers right, it was like 14 within the first year or two. Mm-hmm. Yep, had some sure. evictions and tenant turnovers going over at the same time, had some challenges. So puts out some good information. Howdy, Laura. Glad to see you're here. <laughs> Did you see Rob's comment? You're not average till the second divorce. Dang it, Rob. <laughs> Don't wish that on me. Well, I'm, one of us is average at least. So <laughs> I call those practice runs. Uh, Michelle, howdy. Uh, could you do a short on why... Move into a duplex, even if that is the only rental you get. Yeah. Um, the Zuber talks about getting to four, having a huge financial impact on your future. And if you just have that one duplex, <clears throat> if that's the only rental that you get. So maybe you get the duplex and then five, 10 years later, you move into a house that's your own. Here's a really quick, um, off the top of my head with no research, one of the reasons, so if I do, Michelle, make a video separate on that topic, it will have a lot a lot more structure to it. But one of the reasons why, even if you only got that one duplex, why this can have such a big impact on your life. At, and I hate using this term, but at the normal retirement age, right? So because I don't want people to think age, I want you to think how much, but at the normal society retirement age of 65, the average net worth of the person who owned their home is $221,000. That's their average net worth. The average net worth of somebody who's been renting their entire life is $6,800. There's a significant difference between $221,000, $6,800. Add a rental to that that you buy at today's rate. You pay off over 30 years. So you buy it when you're 30, 40, or 50. And when you're 60, 70, or 80, you have the house that you're in. You have this one rental that has appreciated, probably doubled in price once or twice over that period of time with an average increase in property value of 5% per year. And here's a quick caveat. Generally, the price of the value of property never changes, but the inflation impacts how many dollars it takes to buy it by 5% per year. So over a few decades, that's a significant increase. While the tenants paid off the debt, you reduced or eliminated your duplex while you lived there until you bought your house. And then the unit paid, probably paid for your mortgage. Those are a couple of things. You basically can almost live for free or you really reduce that largest expense that you have. And, and there's a little, there's really simple math that I, that I think I've talked about in one video. I moved from my house into an apartment and I rented the house out for two years. And then I purchased uh, my first duplex. When I was in the apartment, I was paying about $1,500 a month. There was a couple of times it was like 13, 15, 50, you know, back and forth because I moved during those two years. When I moved into the duplex, my mortgage payment dropped to $300. So here's the math. In order for me to have the $1,500 for the apartment um, payment because of my taxes, I would have to make $1,800 or $1,900 a month in income to have the $1,500 to pay that. When I reduced the payment down to $300, I would need to make $360 or $380 to make that payment. So the difference was $60 to $80 
at that smaller amount, and it was three or four hundred dollars at the larger amount. So the taxes on top of the savings for the, the house hack adds up over time exponentially. So even if you just got the one duplex, you could add hundreds of thousands of dollars to your net worth at that, I hate to say it, retirement age. Zuber talks about getting to four because when he first started, he thought if I could just get four rentals and retire at 65, I will have an amazing retirement. And then he got to four and he realized, wow, if I can do this, look at these other things I could do and was able to retire at 45 instead of 65. Um, been retired in like five years now. Uh, options open up for sure. Yeah, the, White, howdy. The, the one duplex that I have, it was my first property, this house hack duplex. Um, you know, my mortgage payment on this thing is $2,400 a month. I'm going to binder strategy my tenants here in a couple of months. I anticipate we're going to get to about 2,400 bucks in rent right now. It's 2150. It's way under, uh, which means that within five years of closing on this property, one side of the duplex covers the entire mortgage payment. One of the reasons why you want to pay, why you want to pay your house off as Dave Ramsey suggests is so that you have access to all of your income pay the entire house off, you have access to it. And his second reason of course, is of course, so you own it, so it can't be taken from you. But that's not true because you could lose it in any number of different ways. But that if you pay off that house, it could take you a long time to pay it down. However, in my case, just by buying a duplex, it took me less than five years of just modest rent increases, not even taking it up to the maximum amount that it will go. And I've already knocked out the mortgage, so I no longer have a mortgage payment. So, you know I mean? pick one or the other. You pay off your own house. Great. You get a duplex. Now, if I move out, get another one. Now I'm doubling my mortgage payment and you just rinse and repeat as many times as you want. But Zuber was right. If he had just gotten four, he would have an amazing retirement. 30 years after he bought his first one, when those were paid off in California, he would have an amazing retirement. That is actually all it takes. If you consider your retirement, something you're aiming for at the age of like 65. If you want to retire earlier than that, well, four is probably not going to do it. You're going to have to work a little harder. Um, yes, I, I absolutely agree. You're going to have to work a little harder or be a little more creative. Like I've had Tiffany and another young lady on here. Both of them have three rentals. are completely retired on that income. Uh, Tiffany has roommates and has three, worked at paying them off. So, I mean, there is a way to structure it with only a few rentals and never have to work again in your life. Um, and when you use your binder strategy, Mike, I, so since you're at 21, you're, you're looking at 24 and you're way under, I hope you have the experience that I have from a friend of mine named Chris that reached out, sent an email and it's really short, just sent an email. So I would appreciate it if you could send me this, if you have anything similar and you could send me an email to Dion, it's D-I-O-N because your autocorrect is going to put an E in there for some reason, Dion at DionTalk.com. Chris says, howdy. Thanks, Chris, for the howdy. Uh, I did the binder strategy and the tenant asked for an increase higher than I anticipated, which is generally what happens with the binder strategy. Great. Uh, <laughs> so I'm hoping that you experience the same thing. And maybe you'll be like Michelle and Dan, who I still need to make the video of, uh, with, where they did the binder strategy and the tenants suggest, both in both cases, the tenant suggested a number that was so big, Michelle and Dan were not comfortable with it. So they countered with a lower number than what the tenant suggested. So imagine how happy the tenant is that the tenant goes, okay, this, this sounds good, let's set it here. And the owner says, that's cool. That's, uh, let's lower it a little bit, make your life a little bit better. That's a happy tenant. If there's anybody here, because I'm pretty sure you do. If, if you don't know what the binder strategy is, let me know in the comments and I'll do a quick 30 second explanation. Tom, congratulations, Tom, this sounds cool. Going to make an offer on a duplex as soon as they get back to me with answers to some questions. No rush days on market. Nice. I have a couple let too where I reach out to my agent and I say, first, verify, no HOA. Um, a couple of other questions on him and I have some offers that will be going out here soon too. Now that I've decided that I will not be buying in Portugal. Still in Portugal. I'll be here till the 10th. I will not be buying here. I'm a fit. Howdy, smash the like button. <laughs> Freeloaders. Nice. Every time you hit the like button, an angel does get its wings. Uh, Josh, I paid off my house so I could stack cash faster and I could possibly use equity if I wanted to. Could have grown faster with more debt, but I like de-risking when my family sleeps at night. So that's that's when I was probably talking about that, where a lot of people want to pay off their things. So the, the amount of income that you paid off your your, your mortgage 
could have been used to acquire a small multifamily that had more equity than what you've paid off in your house, even though it's paid off, giving you a more secure position than having your house paid off. Because imagine not paying your taxes. Who owns your house then? Um, there, and I, st- I also put in the caveat, there's no right way to do this. So it's never wrong to pay off. I made a huge mistake. One of the biggest mistakes I've made since I got into investing, and I paid off a mortgage because I, I was, you know, the bank lenders were letting you get to four and I didn't look up DSCR asset-based or seller financing or educate myself on them. So I got to four, paid off my house, which was my highest interest rate, lowest debt. So it hit the debt avalanche, debt snowball theories, paid it off, but that money could have, so while it's added probably, $1,200 a month in cash flow by having that house paid off, it could have added 4000 the same amount of money could have added $4,000 a month if invested into a small multifamily property. So for me, it was definitely a mistake. To and fro global, howdy. Michelle, I had an opportunity to come up for seller financing and I passed. They wanted more cash than I could give for the down. It will happen. And this one is going to a fellow group member. Nice. Actually, Right after you posted it, Michelle, I took a screenshot because I saw the person that you named that you mentioned that's in that Seattle Investors Club posted on Facebook again. So I figured something had changed. Um, hold on. I want to talk about why you shouldn't sell your home when you have a this this super low mortgage. Because we keep talking about how, you know, a 3% mortgage is an asset. And uh I don't think people understand exactly what makes that an asset and why it would be a bad idea to pay your house off. If, if you've taken out a loan on your house and you got that loan at two or three or even 4%, we're probably not going to see, we're definitely not going to see two or three again, probably for a very long time. Maybe, maybe you could end up getting a f- high force at some point in the next few years, maybe. But that two or 3%, that is going to be untouchable for 30 years. It can never change. And so as an investor, when I look at the playing field of all these different properties out there that I want to buy, and I'm looking at most of these people want me, want me to take a loan to buy their property, or I have to use cash to buy their property. But if I can assume a mortgage, if I could do an assumable loan or a subject to loan, and the loan that I'm assuming has a two or a three percent, I will pay a premium in price to assume that loan. What does that mean? Well, you might want to sell your house for 500 grand, and that's what the market dictates 500 grand at a seven percent interest rate. But I might be able to pay you 600 grand if you let me assume the loan you already have and then just pay you the extra 100,000 in cash outside of the deal or seller finance it back to you. So if you have one of these lower interest loans, why it's a bad idea to pay it off. And the advice I would give for someone, especially just a regular person, don't pay it off. That is an asset you can charge a premium to for an investor because an investor can afford to overpay. And this kind of goes back to your earlier point on total cost of ownership, where I think you're wrong and we disagree is only on real estate because I can afford to overpay if I get the terms that help me cash flow the deal. So I don't want to pay more than I should and have a large payment and the property doesn't cash flow. But if I can pay 600 grand for a house that's worth 500 grand, but for the next 30 years, I'm going to hold it at a significantly lower payment. I'll take that significantly lower payment cash flow for 30 years. And yes, I will gamble that over 30 years, I'll make up that hundred grand in there somewhere. And so I would not encourage people to pay off those low interest rate mortgages because they truly are an asset that someone will pay a premium on. And then the other point that I talked with Michelle about, and I talked with Crystal about, if you get... I will pay you your price, Mr. Seller, if you give me my terms. And my terms are, I need the best cash flowing asset that I can get. I don't care if I'm going to end up paying a little bit more to you because, again, what do you end up paying the bank in time over time in interest? Way more than the actual price of the house. So I don't care if I pay more than the house is worth to the seller. I'm going to do it to the bank anyways. But if I pay it to the seller and get better terms than the bank's going to offer me, now I can cash flow better, and that gives me what I really want, which is the financial freedom to live life like Big Deal. So, when it comes to total cost of ownership, when it when it comes to liabilities, it's a huge factor. When it comes to assets, here's a quick example, and this could probably be a short if I can get it into less than a minute. I'm going to ask a question of everybody that's watching. And a few people hopefully will make a comment. Just answer this comment. This is not to trick the YouTube algorithm. I actually want to know where your minds are at. 
<clears throat> if you were looking at a property and when you purchase it, you are going to get a 10% yield. It is going to produce 10% on the money that you invest in it. If you could purchase it and you could go with a lender that gave you a 5% interest rate, a 10% interest rate, or a 20% interest rate, and when you bought the per when you purchased the property, it was going to produce you a 10% yield. Which interest rate would you prefer? Let me know in the comments. We're going to go over a couple of things here, but I want to know 5%, 10%, or 20%. Which interest rate makes the most sense to you? There are several answers, but there's only really one right answer. And I see so a I, couple of comments. Let me get a clarifying question. You're saying that your return is going to be a 10% return. No, matter uh, what. That's it. You're going to get a 10% return. I want to know, do you want the 5% interest rate loan, 10% interest rate loan, or 20% interest rate loan? And, and it, I'm not saying get a loan where you think you can refinance in the future. I mean, right now in the moment, if you were choosing between loan products, which one would be the best for you? Tom says, I hope to get involved in seller finance deals one day. I hope you do too. Ned talks, better question, and this was about one of my points on middle class, what payments can my rentals afford? That's exactly, uh, when, you, when your assets are growing, I think your rentals afford to buy more rentals, so how much more can you save to buy? But once you reach financial freedom, once you start living on your assets, I look at it that way too. I have a vehicle duplex. And when I first acquired it, it was making like 1400 bucks a month. Now it's making like twenty one fifty a month in profit. So that's my vehicle allotment. When I buy my next vehicle, Every month that's setting aside that amount of money and pure profit that will, in my mind, be set for my next vehicle, which I'm going to buy in probably two or three years. And it'll probably have, I don't know, at that point in time, 110000 or so would be the budget for the budget for the next vehicle. Because that rentals payments can afford that payment, which will probably be a cash purchase. Tom, but what if I save in a high yield account? A, remember, so Tom, I did a video a while ago while I was at, um, not quite Ocean Shores, but the beach from Ocean Shores, on what would make more sense, a 10% return in stocks, or let's go with a savings account, or a 5% cash on cash return in real estate. I mean, I'd, I'd always rather take the real estate. Right, because ten percent return in savings or in stocks is then taxed. You right. with the stocks, you only and let, you, you can get it with dividends, which the average yield on dividends is like two point six percent. So it's not going to be ten percent. Um, but if it's from a savings account, it is then taxed. Whereas the five percent cash on cash is based on your cash flow. The average annual increase in real estate is 5% on the gross value, which you're going to put 20 or 25% down on your property. So you're going to get four times that. So instead of gaining 5% in appreciation, you're going to be gaining 20. And then every year, there's about a 1% pay down on your, your loan. So that's 26% return on a 5% cash on cash return with real estate versus whatever you're going to get in that savings account. It never makes sense even if it was double the return to invest in another asset class to me than it does in real estate. So yes, Tom, I see the laughing faces because I know you were being silly. Flash of light. Sweat equity is, is the real estate equivalent of getting good grades. Are you doing it wrong if you DIY and not outsourcing to PM when you could be getting more deals instead of plunging a toilet? So here's a good example, um, Mark, of, of uh, not Mark, it's flash of light. So for some reason I was thinking financial firefighter. But why what, does it make sense to have a PM than do it yourself? So first, the property manager usually makes more than you do on your properties in, in, in whenever you're using debt. Uh, so for me, no, because I'm going to double my income by managing myself, not just add. Remember, if a property manager takes you 10%, that's 10% of gross. It's usually about 50% of net. Second, it takes me two hours a month to manage. I'm, I'm here in Portugal. I've been here for like three weeks. I got another week, two weeks to go, right? So two weeks in a day. I have, while I've been here, <laughs> I've replaced a garage door motor, had a shower that turned on and wouldn't turn off, and magically had three refrigerators fail, but two of those refrigerators were in properties over like 10 years before I bought them, so it was time to go. I still won't hit the two hours this month, self-managing. That was 
uh, not even 10 texts, not even three emails, uh, all of that. So self-managing doesn't mean I'm ever, you said here, if you're, if you're outsourcing to a PM when you could be getting more deals instead of plunging a toilet. I haven't had to be at, at a unit in a decade. Ever. I've gone. I've taken videos of YouTube when I had a tenant or a unit. I had never been in before, so I went and recorded what the inside looked like. But uh, if you self-manage, if you invested a difference, the most important person on your team, in my opinion, is your property manager. So Mike does a really good job of having a good relationship with property managers at a distance. Totally makes sense. If Mike house hacks three times in Seattle, gets three duplexes, lives in that area, develops relationships with handyman in that area, has people that he can call, networks with other investors in the area, and then Mike moves to Florida to become a realtor that he's talked about once he retires from law enforcement. He doesn't need a property manager for Washington. He has all those processes in place. I'm in Portugal. I want to go back for that quick drive-by to our event in May on the 19th and 20th in Portland for the Northwest Action Summit, which still has a few spaces available. But then I'm off to Thailand for a month or three, and then I got the cruise in September, and then I'm going to figure out where I want to spend the winter. It doesn't take any time to self-manage 16 rental units. If you're Matt, 137 units with $600,000 worth of rehabs going on, managing the cruise, yeah, that's going to be a time sink. Um, so at some point, there might be an economy of scale where it makes sense. But even with Zuber, you know, he writes a multiple six-figure check every year to his property management company that could be his if he had the systems in place with handyman that he would just handle himself. And with, with things like Hemlin, you can dispatch it from the website where you're never even interacting with the tenant or the handyman to get the things done. You just see the interactions and step in if you feel like it. Self-managing rental properties, thats there's two things that are also in the middle-class mindset. First, I don't want to invest in real estate because I'm not handy. That, that's a sentence I hear from a lot of people. I've gone and worked with a handyman to learn the scope and size of what does it take to repair a deck or put in a screen door or something simple like that that I didn't know how to do. So now I know when I do it, how much time it should take, what, what it should cost. Not because I'm ever going to go do it myself. You don't need to be handy. And the other thing is those expenses, I just replaced the garage door motor and the shower thing and the plumbing work done and the refrigerators. I look forward to those expenses. So the middle-class mindset is I have money coming in from rentals, but every time I have to fix something, it costs me money. And that's not how it works. When we purchase a rental, we have cash flow that is calculated after principal interest, taxes, and insurance. So your debt and your expenses like taxes and insurance and setting aside for repairs, maintenance, and vacancy. So the first year when you buy a rental, it feels like you pay for those things because it's part of your cost to acquire those maintenance items in the first year. But as you've saved up that, I do 15% per month of gross rents, which is over $3,000 a month going into an account that just goes into that account for repairs. So in an average year, that's over $36,000. When I normally spend about 12 grand, I've had two years where I did roofs and had some big expenses and multiple tenant turnovers where I didn't spend more that year. I have never yet spent over $40,000 in repairs in one year, but that's not my money. That's the tenant's money. For me to not go to the property and do it myself, the middle-class mindset is I would go plunge the toilet because who's going to pay somebody else to do that? Me. I want to pay a pro. I don't go on my roof and put a roof on. Um, it's, it's a great way of looking at it, but Property management is very expensive and to me only makes sense at a distance. Or if you don't have people skills or a backbone, if you can't stick to your lease and the tenants will walk all over you, it's absolutely worth every penny to put a professional in between you and those problems. You, you got to be careful with your property management software too, because every now and then they might steal your strategy for bindering people. You'd be real careful. <laughs> Yeah, they might actually send out a mass email to every one of their owners saying, hey, we've got a strategy where we can get your tenants to ask you to raise the rent. I'm like, oh, we do, do we? They send it to me. It's hilarious. <laughs> By the way, that was uh, Lumberjack who texted me that little point. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. You could have put that in the comments, Matt. I would have been totally fine with that. <laughs> uh, but thank you for considering the idea that I might not have wanted to be public with that. Um, it's only the dating stuff that I say never talk about. Tom. Millennial Mike, what is your freedom number? Great question, Tom. And I have a little bit of heartburn over this question. 
Because what is the bare minimum number that I would need to make in order to quit my job and make all my basic living needs, no exceptions? I think I could do it on 1500 bucks a month. Now, then I would also have to factor in what healthcare costs. Um, and I'm not exactly sure. I haven't done the research. But I don't want to live bare bones, basic necessities. I want to have a life that's a little bit similar, more similar to Dion. So that's why I usually target the $10,000 a month in passive income as my goal before I would even consider seriously retiring. And I'll probably shoot past that because Lumberjack's the one who constantly coaches me up on things like, hey, bro, guess what? It's going to be pricey to have health care. So that number you think is going to work for you ain't really going to work for you. Right now, uh, I'm just focusing on creating more passive income or rental property income. I've got my milestones, my markers. I hit a personal milestone. Uh, it was not all profit, but for the very first time, I had enough properties purchased and stabilized that I got more money in a month from my rental properties than I did from my regular job. I, I pulled in $10,000 in rental income into my bank account. And my salary is publicly, you, know, you can Google what my salary is as a cop here in Washington. You know, I bring in about 7,500 bucks a month as a cop and I brought in $10,000 in rental income. And I looked at my bank and I was like, dang, this is one of those light bulb moments where you're like, it's real. It's almost the, the snowball. Here's the snowball. I should have called Dion, but he was in Portugal. You could still call. That's true. Um, yep. So maybe Mike, one of these days you should take a whiteboard and do a, here's my cash flow kind of thing. Cause that was literally, I think the day I decided that I, as soon I'm going to retire, I started saying sometime between three years and tomorrow, I'll be retiring because I did, the, I hadn't really sat down and looked at the math. And I think this is the same thing that Zuber talks about in his book, One Rental at a Time. He says, every time the cash flow came in, he was acquiring the next property or doing the next rehab and he was spending the money on that. And then at one point they sat down and did the math and his, he was at the point where his wife could completely retire. He probably could have too, but he was, he was really enjoying his job. And they didn't realize it until they looked at the numbers because while you're investing, while you're just saving for the next thing and you're putting the money in, we don't really see how much money is coming in. That could be ours if we weren't in growth mode still. Zero to hero. Howdy. A trap of the lower and middle class is having multiple cars instead of one good car that is paid off for a small payment. Um, there were a lot of years of my life where I had to have at least three cars so that one would run well enough to get me to work because I didn't have. Uh, when I had all of the initial debt that I didn't know about until the divorce, the ability to go and acquire that one car that would probably run. And they had to be older cars so I could work on them myself. It had to be, you know, not as computer chipped as the, the cars made in the last 15, 20 years were. So most of my vehicles were from the 90s. I kept them up until 2012 was when I was using the old cars. Um, but you're right, having multiple cars is kind of a trap of the when you look at multiple registrations, here's the thing in Washington state. So check your local laws if this will work in your state. <clears throat> if you own an older, if you own a car that's paid off, so you don't have to have like that full coverage insurance, you don't have to insure your car to legally be on the road in Washington state. You can insure yourself with this thing called broad form insurance. So I could drive any car and it costs me $30 a month. Or I can insure each car for $60 a month. So three cars would have been $180 or insure myself for 30 bucks. Now I get in a wreck in my car, that car's trashed. It just gets hauled away to the compound yard and it's gone. But that was cheaper than insuring my vehicles to just have broad form insurance on myself. So that's, that is kind of a hack that I don't really recommend if you don't have the ability, you know, the other cars that could run that you could just replace one and not care about losing it. I did like your facial expressions there, Mike, when I first said it, and you're like, oh, bull, no, I can't do that. I know, and I I, you hear broad form, and you're like, oh, yeah. You pull someone yeah. over, you see broad form, and they're covered, and no ticket. Yep. They're good. The the motoring traffic cop inside of me for a second went, hold on, let's slow it down here. Let's I just pump the brakes a little bit here, Dion. I could literally see, see it happen on your face. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle. It points out a very good point that the five planner takes 1%. Some might take 0.5, some takes two, right? But let's do the math on just 1%. Um, sounds small, 1%. How big could that be, right? But they make that 1% if you make money or you lose money. So if you have $100,000 in assets under management, which is really small compared to the 3 million that you need to retire, right? So 3 million, these numbers get exponentially bigger. But if you have $100,000 and they're investing it for you, somebody's monitoring your money instead of you doing it yourself, and they take 1%. So 
it's only a thousand dollars, right? They're going to take a thousand dollars. So if you gain ten thousand dollars, now your hundred thousand becomes one hundred and ten. They get eleven hundred, so they get a little benefit when you do, right? But if you lose ten thousand, your hundred thousand becomes ninety. You've lost ten thousand dollars. They make nine hundred bucks. Right, they're still going to get their one percent, whether you make money or lost money. You lost ten thousand dollars and then paid nine hundred dollars for that, and that one percent. We understand this when we talk about investing. The sooner you invest, the more time there is for compound interest to kick in. A one percent from your total assets under management, when you're gaining four or six percent a year, is a mass twenty percent of your gains in some cases. Um, that goes to someone else to take care of your money. This, to, to me, it's one of the kind of bigger scams out there. Not that the, the financial planner is a scam, it's that people fall for, this is the way I want to invest and have somebody else run it, who benefits by choosing the programs that you invest in based on their compensation package. I think I think for me, that was that was probably one of the earliest things that ever woke me up to the matrix, not to go back to that reference too much and beat it like a dead horse. At 23 years old, I, I listen to Dave Ramsey from 18 to 23. And I do like Dave Ramsey. I think he has a serves a purpose. He, he teaches to the lowest common denominator. There are people out there who are so completely irresponsible with money, they shouldn't be allowed to have a credit card. Have at it, Dave. Beat them up until they figure out how to live their lives better. But I listened to Dave Ramsey from 18 to 23. And at 23 years old, I called one of his endorsed local providers, one of his smart Vester Pro recommended financial planner guys. And I met with the individual. And they broke it down for me. They came up with this plan, my plan for my life for retirement. You know, they break out the next 40, 50 years of my life, what putting a certain amount of money into a Roth IRA is going to do for me combined with my 401k at work and then social security to crank out this number at the end. And then they project how long you can live off that number if you want to withdraw a certain amount and live a certain lifestyle. And I noticed two things. First, I didn't want to retire at 65. I wanted to be crazy and say I wanted to retire at 55. I know, wild, right? 10 years ahead of schedule. Okay. So I said, I want to retire at 55 and I want to be able to live on like, I can't remember the exact dollar. Right? It was like 5,000 bucks a month or something, not outrageous, but you know, something small. So he cranks it into his formula, pumps out the spreadsheet and shows me, okay, you retire at 55. You've completely run out of money by 65 years old. You now have nothing because you didn't, you gave up those extra 10 years of your assets compound interesting into a larger number. You retired too early. You're now poor and broke. You have to work to your 65 just to get the low number that you want of like $5,000 a month in retirement. And that for me was when I woke up that combined with the fact that I'm talking to probably a 45 to 50 year old guy. And I'm like, if this is the guy that's a financial expert, this is the guy who is the approved person from this financial God that is Dave Ramsey. Why am I talking to like a 50 year old dude why is he not retired? Why is he still working? How come he isn't at the point that I would envision myself being at when I'm his age? If he hasn't made it on his program, do I really have confidence that I'm going to make it on that program? And then if I follow the program, built right into it is failure. Complete, total failure. Well, we don't account for the possible raises. And okay, sure enough, fine. You're going you're gonna to adjust for a 3% raise every year. But in reality, I'll probably do better than that. And I will. Because he projected I wouldn't make a hundred grand until I was like 48. I did it by the time I was like 27. But I mean, it's just, it just frustrates me back to the point of the videos that we just live in this culture that keeps us poor because we accept this reality that doesn't work. And you'll look at it on paper right there and he'll look you dead in the eye and be like, sign up for this, son. We'll get you started. That is failure. <laughs> No, you have to get out of the freaking matrix and invest in real estate and take it into your own hands. And, and, I don't even think it's that big of a risk. I think that is a much bigger risk than buying a rental property and, and, and risking the dealing with tenants. It's, and so two things when you're talking with those financial planners, the, the first is as soon as you mention that you invest in real estate, they usually just close the door and stop talking to you because they realize you've escaped the matrix. You, you're not going to be paying their fees. You're not going to be subsidizing their working until they're 65. And the second thing is, the financial planner, if they do stay after the year rentals, is they'll say, well, not everyone can do that because then everyone owns and no one would rent. And I'm like, you're right. Not everyone can do that. So this is a YouTube channel that has a little over 13,000 subscribers. There's 100 people right now sitting in this video right now. Out of over 13,000 people that have subscribed to this channel, the 100 people that are here, I put together a course that talks about literally 
the average person reaching financial freedom in less than 10 years, even if you're not starting from the best position, chronologically, step by step, none of this stuff that's in a video where it takes two hours to get the, the couple of minute clips here or there that actually have the life changing information. It's just laid out. There's like 20 people in the course, which is great because we can kind of work really one on one more interactive on the, on the Zoom calls. But so if you go to, and you project all of this information out and you say, if you, Zuber says, buy a rental every couple of years, get to four, your life will be totally different. This microscopic amount of people actually ever educate themselves and take action. So the financial planner is right. Not everybody can do this. And not everybody's going to do this. But the people who can, that can sit back and go, okay, I don't need to work until I'm 65. They don't need to work until I'm 55. Um, 10 years or less to make work optional, I, I think, is, is life changing. All Nighter Hyder says the old adage applies to financial planners. If you want something done right, do it yourself, right? REI Stoners, howdy, good to see you. <laughs> All Nighter Hyder, if someone else has your best interest at heart more than you, you've got the wrong heart. Nice, I like that. It's a t shirt. Great dating advice. Josh, I was just about to send this to you. REI Stoners has a good thing here. It says, I asked, um, my wife, what time it was about an hour ago, and she said it's not time for Dion talk yet. Nice. Uh, Tom Kahn, you have to jump to Saks Live because he asked the Crash Bros. He's going to negotiate a forty percent disrespectful offer since he's my realtor. Nice. Yep, the Crash Bros. that are buying properties that totally tracks. Rob, howdy. This is what you missed for fifteen seconds. Uh, the way you look at finances can keep you trapped in working until you're much older. And a simple shift in the way you look at things can have a huge impact. There you go. Y'all caught up. <laughs> John. Howdy, John. He says, for a second, he thought I was introducing Mike as the one who irritates everyone. Not everyone, but a few someones. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. All Night Hyder says the Ramsey guy. No, the other Dave. The quick thing on Ramsey, and, and maybe people watching this can actually help me. This uh, is kind of a favor. There is a video that Dave Ramsey put out. I think it was right around five, four to six minutes, somewhere. There was a shorter video. It wasn't one of his longer ones. But in the middle of that, somewhere, somebody mentions house hacking. House hacking. And Dave goes on a 30-second rant. And I want to find it so me and Mike can do a reaction video to this video. Hey, I'll pull it up. You want me to pull it up? Do you literally have that video? Because he actually goes, he says, if somebody says the words house hacking, it's a scam runaway. And I'm like, okay, so what's the scam in telling somebody you can use owner-occupied lending to buy a duplex, have somebody rent the other side and lower your cost of living? Point out the scam in this for me. I will... Uh, make you host so you can show your screen i have i have the one that you you sent to me where it uh he talks about owning two thousand pieces of real estate in his life and it's not that easy they're not just going to pay your mortgage anybody who says that doesn't know what they're talking about so what you put in the group text to me and matt recently yeah no i, I don't know that that was it because it was a while ago that i saw it i couldn't find it ever since so I lost it in the, the matrix of, of a YouTube video that was out there. So if somebody even finds that one, it's a short one. And he really just tears into house hacking like it's the dumbest thing ever. And I'm like, first, if I followed any of his middle steps, I would still be working. Second, which, you know, his first two and last step are amazing. And they should apply to everybody. Um, second, if it wasn't for house hacking, I would still be working. gonna find it mike rob asks if you've been shot at this week or shot this not week not this week josh burdick makes a good point here youtube university has a higher roa than a state university changed my mind for the masses anyway i totally agree um what, what was i seeing the other day oh people keep playing this stupid clip but it's actually perfect because it's it's uh stallone in the Tulsa King. So this is a guy that's been in prison for 30 years or something. He gets out and he's in his seventies and somebody asks him about, you know, should they go to college or not or whatever the cut topic was, but he goes on a rant on, yeah, you want to go to college. It's not so you can learn anything. Nobody cares what you know. Nobody cares what your grades are. It's so that you can prove that you can commit to something for four years and show up every day, which is the thought from 30 years ago. 
a college degree meant that you can commit to something. Now it actually means, and this is where I offend everybody, and it means you're stupid, that you racked up all that debt and committed all that time when you could have been learning a trade, making more money, or, and again, the college degree makes sense if it's needed for the field that you work in. But I have a personal friend who has a um, something arts degree and, and has never applied it to any of his occupations. He's currently a truck driver and actually works in your area for that. Uh, what do you call it? The IRT. IRT it works for IRT in your area. So his CDL is where his income is coming from. Um, the arts degree is not it. So I absolutely agree. YouTube University has a better ROI. Oh, for sure. I've made way more money because of what I learned on YouTube. And the number one thing I'm the most pissed about is that I didn't know at 18 or 19 or 20 years old that I could have house hacked. And when I was 18 years old, you know, YouTube was like two years old and there wasn't this stuff on YouTube yet. And if all of the information, like I just had my follow-up conversation with that 16 year old kid who reached out to me, he, uh, he said he loves your channel the most. Cause I had him recommend him like three or four different channels. I made him read one rental at a time, 16 years old from, from Haiti uh, lived here for the lot for most of his life. And he just reaches out to me on Instagram because he found my channel while Googling how to make money in real estate. And like that didn't exist when I was his age and it pisses me off because how much further ahead would I be? Right. <sighs> me too. I actually was talking with Mike about this this morning. We were recording videos for the three amigos and I didn't find this till 2018. I think he, I think he put this out in 2018. So I found it as soon as he put it out. This would have made the first five years so much easier of my investing, just the concepts that are in this book. Uh, and I, I point this out and I have this book here because I actually just finished narrating this. Zuber's got all of the files. He's working with his team to get it out to Audible. So if you don't like the current robot voice that narrates this on Audible, um, I'm hoping that I sound better than a robot. Um, at least put the right emphasis on the right syllable. Uh, REI Stoners. Asked a great question because I am going to be making a video on this, a really, a really simple one. It says, anyone else open to Apple Savings Account using it to help pay a bill or two with the 4.15 interest rate? Yeah, so if you want the Apple Savings Account and you have an iPhone and you've been using Apple Pay, you don't, you can't just go and start the saving account. You have to actually have, and this has been my experience, I need to verify this because I'm halfway through the process. You need to have the Apple Card which then opens up the option to have the Apple saving account on your, in your wallet. So if you don't have the Apple card tied to your Apple pay, there's a couple steps you got to go through to get that saving account set up. But I'm looking into it. I, um, about a month ago, I had the banking experience, which I've talked about a couple of times where I uh, had this weird problem that I'm hoping every single person here has eventually where I had more than $250,000 in the bank and then the banking issues started popping up. So I wanted to make sure I was below the FDIC sure insurance limit, which might not even help because it's looking like FDIC insurance can't cover some banks if they fail, um, with some runs that are going on. So I took the money, cut it in half, put half in each bank, so I wouldn't have over 250000 in each one. And the bank that I moved the money to has a 3.4 introductory rate. And so it was like 400 bucks, 400 and something bucks the first month. Um, and then they give you $525 if the money's been in there for three months. So it's just kind of a money play to move the money over to that bank and diversify for the FDIC insurance. So if I take that $250,000 and put it in the Apple account, getting a better rate, uh, it's, it's kind of counterproductive. I want to be motivated to buy the next property, but if the money's going to sit for a while, we might as well be getting paid for it. Back two, three years ago, where interest rate, you had a choice of 0 0.002 or 0 0.001, it really didn't matter because that was a difference of like $8 a year or $11 a year. Now it's hundreds of dollars a year. Thousands maybe because it's hundreds of dollars a month. Did you take the blue pill or the red pill? And Dividend Dave says, I took all the pills. I've arrested the guy before. <laughs> Handful of times, actually. <laughs> Zero to hero. Mike, it's hard for me mentally to get more debt on real estate because I grew up listening to Dave Ramsey. Yep, good point. And my anger is my $100,000 debt is all good, lower than inflation, but the matrix to limit is real. It is real. Because I have a little less than $1.8 million in debt, I will never have to work again. I wish it was more. I wish it was more as long as the equity position scaled with it. That $1.8 million in debt gives me over $5 million in real estate. So I have a net worth of over $3 million. 
because of the debt. Don't over lever, don't have adjustable rate debt. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard to get out of that, that mindset. My, my brother is absolutely totally financially free, 10 paid off rentals, use a HELOC to do it. He'd take out the HELOC, he had the ability to pay it off before the rate adjusted and he rinsed and repeated. Has called me a moron several times because I have mortgages. While we're walking around goofing off on beaches in Portugal because we never have to work again in our lives, but I'm still an idiot for having mortgages. Um, it is a very hard mindset to, to get away from. A mental shift. Mental shift to make. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Dividend and Dave, I am playing epic theatrical music to Mike's Gospel of the Red Pill. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Uh, well, remember that to, in Zero to Hero is Darius, in case you didn't know that, Dion, who was in Gary with us. Oh, I did not know that. The, uh, you Howdy, know, Darius. Another, another thing that they talk about in The Matrix, the movie The Matrix, is that they don't free someone's mind when they've re- passed a certain age because they're just too indoctrinated. It's too hard for them to get past it. And you mentioned earlier, it's easier to teach something new to children. Well, it's true. You are going to have a lifetime of bad habits, a lifetime of prior education, a lifetime of brainwashing of how the system works. And it's very, very hard to perform that mental switch to convince yourself that, no, it's okay to use debt in this way when you've grown up, especially if you grew up poor like me with nothing, no money. I, to this day, I don't use, and I have never used a checkbook. And the reason why, when I was a kid, and we would have to go out somewhere with my mom in the single mother household, you know, six kids, three different dads, extremely poor. And she would write a check. She would ask, is this going to be cash today or can you not cash it until Monday? And I remember even at the age of like eight years old, being embarrassed and hating the fact that the money wasn't real. And to this day, I refuse to write checks for that reason. And I've never had a checkbook. So I get it. It's tough to overcome and have the mental switch that says it's OK to use debt in this way. But it is. And the only way you can probably do it is by putting yourself around enough people that can help you grow your confidence. So it's essentially using mob mentality for a good thing. We don't want to peer pressure you into doing something stupid, but I will definitely peer pressure you into feeling more comfortable and doing something that will help you reach financial freedom. You're muted. You're muted. I see it because it's my... I want to talk about Yuri here. Uh, you're talking about um, the event in Portland is the Northwest Action Summit. It's on the 19th and 20th. I just saw that as I was scrolling through. I wanted to make sure that we got to that. Um, and Simon is going live on a Tuesday. That's awesome. And we got Sachs going live. We've got a lot of live streams going on. We might wrap this up, go through the questions, make sure we get to as many as possible here. But I don't want to take away people's ability to get good content. Um, this will be here in future land as well. Uh, there was a point where I asked a question and was looking for comments. Yeah. There it is right there. So invest says 5%, Matt says 20%, Millennium Mike says lowest rate. So if your return is 10%, the actual, in my opinion, correct answer is it doesn't matter. As a species, we're always concerned with what someone else makes. So much so that I have some affiliate links in the comments below where you can go and you can get Zuber's book. You can go get the locks that I use on my rentals. And if you click on the locks and you go to Amazon, and you look at that, I'm an affiliate link. So I might make a couple of pennies on your purchase, right? People will go in to the header and back up the Dion Talk Financial Freedom portion so they can still get the item at the same price, not changing them at, at all, but it takes away my ability to benefit from them using that link. Who cares if the bank makes 20% or 5% or 10%? And, and then the, so if you go through the next step, there are some people who would say, well, I would prefer to have the 20% because it's likely to be lower than that in the future and I could refinance and increase my yield, right? We, we need to look at what is my yield? That's the ultimate determined determining factor on what I purchase, not what someone else is going to make. Kind of like the, uh, well, let's look at your interest rate, what the bank is going to make over 30 years. It's significantly more than you pay for the property, right? So you don't want to pay the bank, right? No. If the tenants are paying the mortgage and you're getting the yield you want, who cares how much money the bank makes? 
So what do you think of the new Netflix show, Your Rich Life? Shred. Howdy. So uh, I, tr I tried. I really did. I actually went and binged a bunch of his YouTube content. Guy seemed super smart. If, if he's teaching people to focus on finances, that's a good step, right? But don't buy a house till you have 20% down. This is kind of the dumbest advice that's out there. Um, he just doesn't understand the power of real estate. It's, there was a couple of other, I was going to make a reaction video to it, but I don't want to feel like I'm attacking somebody who's trying to help people. So I'm really not going to talk about it. I'm not a fan. So I'll say that in the middle of this live, because, you know, there's, there's 100 people here. We're an hour and 21 minutes. This isn't going to hit, this isn't going to hit, you know, a lot of people on a show that just came out, because I want finance shows to, to have more of a base. People should be looking at this, even if it's, not the best advice if it says, oh, there, there's a whole world of finances that I can go and look into and educate myself on. And then you find the sources that work for you, whether it's stocks, crypto, entrepreneurship, real estate, doesn't matter. Find the thing that excites you, go into that, and then find the people who've successfully done it. Uh, but I, I can't get into the show. Have you looked at it at all, Mike? This is the clip you sent us to of the guy who was like, I made more money by renting than I would in and owning a real estate. I didn't mention that, that because I was going to go into attack mode, but yeah. You know, I've, <laughs> it's about the only 15 seconds I needed to pass judgment, which coincidentally is a position I've been in with many women, but that's a bad joke, Dion. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. You are a dad. You can make dad jokes. It's okay. When my say. son does it, he's a faux pas, but <laughs> Exactly. It made more money renting in 15 years than owning. It's, a, it's possible, right? You, you, it's not possible. You, you, you could, sense. Um, if you rent. Maybe if, if he's comparing it to buying a house that was not a house hack, maybe, or not buying a, a rental property, maybe. Okay. Right. So, so the home, the average home buyer, this is why he might, this is why I don't want to attack it because he might have good content for the person who's never going to invest. It's never it's like the Dave Ramsey followers that go, okay, I'm, I'm never going to do anything but a retirement account. So, so security is going to help me. I'm going to retire at 65 and it helps them get out of credit card debt, not create more home and park debt than they need. Like this beautiful advice for that average person that doesn't learn how to invest. So Rami Sanji or whatever his name is, Seppi, something like that. Um, I forget his name and I should have it written down because I'm going to talk about it, but somebody asked a question. So I wasn't expecting to, uh, if you looked at your house as an expense and you have to replace the roof and you have to fix the foundation and the water heater and the garage door and all of those things over time, you're going to replace the windows in 30 years or whatever can come up. The expenses of owning that house, if you never capitalized on it as an investment property, renting might make more sense. There's people right now living on cruise ships paying a set of amount every year to just live on the cruise ship and go around for the whole year on the cruise ship makes more sense than owning a house, working remotely, nothing to take care of, repair or maintain, and they get to see the world. Absolutely makes sense. So his point wasn't like, I didn't need jerk reaction, go, okay, that can never work. But it is not going to work for somebody who is an investor. Keith Hager, Hager uh, cash is not king, cash flow is king. There are times when um, cash is a duke or an earl, though, because things like high interest rates happen and penalties for having good credit scores happen or cash might be the right way to go. REI Stoners, do you guys add annual accountant fees and lawyer fees when running numbers on properties? So with seven properties or 16 properties, my CPA fees are exactly the same. So no, um, I have retained an attorney, but never use their services. So no. Um, repairs, maintenance and vacancy is 15% of gross for me. So that would include vacancies, which can include a, an eviction if they happen. How much you Mike? do you account for those? No. Yeah, that's not one that's come up for me much. My, so it's a good question. If you've been watching the Lumberjack Landlords channel recently, I think he had like nine evictions, which is as much as he's had in 20 years because of a program. Now this program existed for every investor out there. So people with the portfolio size of mine and Mike's 
we could have rented to people in the ERAP program, emergency rental assistance program, and got more rent. We could have collected more money, but it's almost almost a certainty that at the end of the program, that person that's been getting free housing for the last 10 to 20 months will not be able to pay their rent when that program ends. And just based on human psychology, once, once you set that level of, I don't have to pay for housing, it's hard to go back to paying it. Uh, so you kind of guarantee an eviction when it's over. Now, Matt has over 130 units. So he did like somewhere between 10 and 20 of his units in the program, trying to be a decent human and helping out people in the program, making a little bit more money because it's the ERAP program, but definitely dealing with a lot more headaches, several evictions, um, and having to deal with the, the few that don't become evictions you're really working with and trying to go, okay, here's how money works, like starting from ground zero. Our portfolio size told us logically we couldn't even do one rental pro one one unit in that program without creating more headache than it's worth. If you're watching Matt's stuff and you're seeing all the evictions, REI stoners, it, it makes total sense. Yeah, he probably factored in the size of his portfolio. Could he? How much could he handle knowing they were probably going to turn into legal issues at the end? Trucking landlord, take the 20% and refi later for a higher return. That was a, that was my thought too. Cool. I uh, just got a text from my handyman. That's how much work it takes. Not handyman. That was my handyman. That was my other investor who's actually helping me solve a problem. So uh, one of the refrigerators is being delivered tomorrow. So the, the nanosecond it took for me to swipe the, the message up is how much time it takes to self-manage property once you have <laughs> the uh, systems in place. Yeah. Um, Later, I might actually text it the tenant and say, this is the window when your refrigerator is coming. Um, so just take a couple of texts. But it would take that much with a property manager too. A refrigerator is generally over the $500 threshold that the property manager has to check with you to see if you're okay with the expense and if you want to shop the resource or not, or the, the uh, material or not. Mm -hmm. Jerry, howdy. I love that you're here too. Sean, it doesn't matter. Nailed it. As long as your return is the same, the interest rate on what you're getting on the debt, it doesn't matter. No, nope. Andy, you're not missing anything. The rate, uh, as long as your yield stays the same, you've already researched it and the rate doesn't matter. These are some great questions. Irrelevant Ninja Vanish, yeah. Laura, my emergency money is in a high yield account. That's that's you should put the emergency money somewhere where it's getting a return because your emergency money is not something we're going to use. That's great. Adam Calhoun, I agree. It would be the hardest mentally to get around paying twenty percent interest to somebody, but right now, Millennial Mike has a, a pretty good program going that he's done with a, at least at least one person that I physically have met and know where that person's getting 10% where Mike could have went and got a loan to the bank at, you know, probably seven or 8% right now on the same deal, but 10% to this investor, because Mike's return is good enough to where it doesn't matter. As long as his yield is there, that the, the interest rate that he's doing with the amount of work that went into approving with the bank versus approving with this private investor made more sense. Um, easier to get your mind around then. I'm doing with for a month or three. That's the beauty of being financially free. I, I have no idea how long I'm going to stay anywhere. Um, living some places like dating a month or three. It's about what I got. Um, Richard, howdy, wandering dog. Howdy. I have rentals, five units, and 28 private placement investments in LCs, various commercial real estate. I spend five hours per quarter on real estate. I early retire in my 30s and traveling the world now. That, um, that sounds like something to aspire to. I'm trying to catch the chat dream. with the traveling. That's your dream. Yeah, exactly. Beautiful. I want to be able to Do use I... your brother's pickup line on a bunch of waitresses in foreign countries. That's my goal. Ladies. Is, uh, how do you, what was it? Ladies, do you have change for a million dollars? Or what was it that guy said earlier was, today on Zoom? That was, yeah, we said that. That was hurt. Oh, Kurt's. that was, uh, yeah, yeah, we don't want to call him out publicly, but yeah, great line. And he was quoting a show. Right. Excuse me, do you have change for a million? No, my brother's <laughs> best line here in Portugal was, do you speak English? Can you, how, how do you say multimillionaire in Portuguese? <laughs> Getting notes. Right. Wandering Doc is enjoying it so much. Dion is right. I've had property managers and probably found one decent one out of 12 I tried. To me, it's not worth it. 
So yeah. if you're investing in a distance like Mike is, I would recommend having a property manager. If you're in a situation like mine where you can invest where you live and develop the systems and relationships and learn how to use the Thumbtack app. So recently I had the garage door motor replaced by a, a contractor from the Thumb, Thumbtack app. In the interaction, I said, well, what else do you do? And so Benjamin from Top One Garage Door on the Thumbtack app, well, I'm going to be making literally a video specifically about his is basically a licensed contractor, but handyman that can do all of these different things. And garage door work is kind of unique. You have to have experience to do this. Like I have a other handyman that bought the motor, took it there and was like, I'm not, I'm not putting it in on the skill set. So that's how I found him. Well, now that's a new handyman to help me with my systems that I've never met personally, but based on the reviews, hiring him for one simple task where the tenant's um, interaction was several positive statements about the interaction. I now have another handyman in the area it's easy to self-manage as long as you have at least two or three capable handymen that you know their limits. I have a handyman that can do all kinds of things, but doesn't do carpet. So I know if I have carpet, I'm not even going to bother them with them. They'll do LVP flooring, other things. But once you have that, the, the need for the property manager is not there. As long as you have people skills and a backbone and will stick to your own leases. Jerry, with my rentals in Tacoma, Washington, I tell tenants... Uh, Jerry, are you going to the Northwest Action Summit, Jerry? There is a Jerry from Tacoma that is supposed to also be going as a presenter. I'm not sure. It's the same Jerry. Tacoma, Washington, I tell tenants, let me ask my partner, even though I don't have one. So I do this. I, it's not that I don't have one. It's just that I don't tell my tenants that my partner is my son's cat. And any big decision that comes up, I have to check with my partners before I say, oh, no, I can't allow you to put an atrium in the backyard because, you know, my partners don't think that's a good idea. Um, I see we have a super chat popped up and then let me see if I can keep where I'm at here. Dave, can just, you go through? This you is you. To read it? The super chat? No, no, it wasn't me. No, I'll get to that. Can you go through and make sure there's no questions that I'm not sure through? Because I see you yawning and you've had a long day and I don't want to keep you up past. Oh, no, no, no. I'm good. Time. I'm good. I'm just old. You know, it's 1.33 in the morning here right now. It's awesome. My yeah, poor brother. Multiple naps a day. I do. I don't have that sleep schedule like everyone else. Dividend Dave. Howdy. Thank you for the super chat. What's the difference between beer nuts and deer nuts? Beer nuts are a dollar ninety nine. Deer nuts are just under a buck. Nice. There you go. Dad joke. We've got more dad jokes. <laughs> so here's a here's the thing. When you do a super chat, or sometimes just when you do a chat message, I will almost read it verbatim, reading it as I'm processing it. <laughs> so. You can get me if you want to. Uh, try not to get me demonetized, though. Uh, Afro-capitalist asked, while saving to buy rental properties in the beginning, do you use a retirement account to offset paying too much tax with all the overtime Uncle Sam takes too much? No, I did on accident. I was maxing out retirement accounts. And then when I took it out, I paid more tax than I would have because it all came out at once. And if you're in most years, you're also going to add a 10% penalty on top of the taxes. So while we're saving for that next investment, one of the things that house hacking helps is it lets us get into the property with a lower down payment and a better interest rate. But that lower down payment means we have to save for less time to get into that property. Um, and if you rinse and repeat that every couple of years, you're not saving up 60, 80 you know, thousand dollars every time you buy a property with just the down payment or the purchase, in, as in, in your case. <laughs> Retirement accounts for me uh, make three people wealthy and none of them are you. The first is your employer because they get employee retention and recruitment from having retirement programs because there are people who haven't looked into them or are never going to invest. So it's a better strategy than nothing. So it brings them in, keeps them. Second, the government makes more money on your retirement account because you are going to pay more taxes in the future and you're probably going to have more income in the future than you plan on. And the third person that makes money just like a financial planner, whether you make money or lose money is the people managing the accounts. So no, I wouldn't recommend that. Maybe if you're saving in the beginning, you could find a better way to get interest for a year or two while you were saving. If you did a high yield savings account, a CD, um, bought a bond on a short term, you know, something like that. 
Uh, Andy Borch has a question about your course. He says, I wanted to buy your course, Dion, but I had purchased Matt's course just before your course came out. A lot of expenses are coming his way because he's closing his first deal. So Andy, congrats, man. Congrats on getting the first deal. That's freaking fantastic. Hope you're enjoying Lumberjack's course. And uh, I don't think Dion will take it personally that you got Matt's first. He released his first. No, actually, when I was looking at putting the course together, because it was this is the large price tag to just put it together. I was thinking that there was kind of a finite number of people who would take these courses. And with Matt's course coming out first, that a lot of people that would have taken either would take his. Um, they're, they're different. I'm not saying take both. You've got your deal. You've got Matt's course. You're doing fine. And you have my email. Just reach out, right? But mine, my information is designed to get financial freedom, the simplest way for the lazy person in the most concise actual education format that I can put together. Matt says, you are a landlord. You have closed on the deal. Here's the systems and processes you can do to be a better, what does he call it? Um, not performer. Operator. operator. He can be a better operator, right? So total, two totally different um, versions of it. Um, and then the one thing I say is, is, is everything that's in my course, and I think everything that's in Matt's course is on our YouTube channels in thousands of hours of content, sometimes two or three hour live streams where there was a three minute section that had the thing that's going to impact your investing versus in the course, you're not really paying for hidden secret sauce. Like we're trying to give away this information, but to put it into a format that that's that concise and in a syllabus curriculum designed like classroom format that you can go back to the specific information. Because when you make a video on YouTube, in order for YouTube to work, there's, the, there's like a structure to it. And, and Mike is actually kind of a bit better at this than I am, especially when you do your videos on uh, calling out fake gurus, right? You get tens of thousands of views. You, you, you make the video with a good thumbnail that gets the person to click on it. So you have a click through rate. Then the person watches in the first few seconds, you have enough info to draw them in. You give them a hook to watch till the end. Then they have to know who you are, why your opinion matters to them on this subject, then the subject matter that you're covering, and then the info that matters. Whereas in the course, you're actually just getting the info that matters because you already know who we are. You already know what our story is. So if if filtering down the information helps you, that's what those courses are designed for. If you have thousands of hours, and maybe when, some, when you see a question in the chat, you answer it verbatim exactly how I'm going to answer it because you've seen my content so many times. And I actually had somebody reach out the other day and said, they really want to thank me for sometimes answering the same question over and over and over. That's because I know that person hasn't asked it over and over and over. It's the first time they've even thought somebody to ask this online. And when and that's their one chance to get a detailed, articulate answer. I'm okay with answering questions. that we, I've, How many times has, uh, should I put my properties in an LLC come up? Literally watch Mike and Matt and Zuber just kind of sit back. Okay, I got five minutes. Wait for Dion to get off the soapbox. And <laughs> but we know what the answer is going to be. Uh, Julie Anderson, we're still middle class, right? When we are upper middle class. So I don't think we're middle class at all, Julie, if we get the mindset mm -hmm. of putting our money to work. Like the, the biggest difference between, and I'll make this as quick as possible. And if you can find the next question, Mike, the, the, the biggest difference between poor people, middle class and wealthy people, Julie, isn't how much money they make or how much money they have. It's what you think the purpose of money is. As soon as you change your opinion of what the purpose of money is, you go from one to the other. It doesn't take a bunch of action or time or anything like that. It's just, if you are poor, you think the purpose of money is to buy things. So if you want things, you work hard to get money to buy things. If you are middle class, you think the purpose of money is debt. So you want a good credit score to buy a big house and a nice car and have the debt so people think you are successful. As soon as you get the mindset, the shift, that the purpose of money is to buy money, you're wealthy. Now you just have to go through the implementation of building that wealth, protecting that wealth, diversifying it once you have it to protect it. But so I don't think that if you're here, very many people are going to, if we are middle-class now, going to remain that way for very long. Um, okay. So Esther says, you guys changed my perspective on investing. Thank you. You're welcome, Esther. Uh, and then we have Sam Farho asks, he goes, Mike, how do you go to courts if you have an eviction and you're, and you're not in the market? Oh, uh, that's a great question. My property manager goes to court for me on my behalf. My eviction costs about 600 bucks. Takes about three weeks to complete. 
lawyer files the paperwork, takes a couple of weeks from there to get it all processed. And then the property manager goes in there and represents me. That's part of our contract. It costs me $25 to pay for her fee to go to the court. It's pretty freaking cheap. It's, uh, it's, it's unreal, honestly. Another one of the things where I absolutely believe it's justified to have property management at a distance. Like that, mm-hmm. that right there. Also, um, I have a friend in Washington who self-manages her duplex, went through an eviction last year. It was it last year? Might have been the, might have been the beginning of this year. Never went to court. Paid the retainer for the, you know, paid the retainer for the attorney. The attorney goes to court for you. You don't go to court. You can. You can be a mat and go in there and enjoy the process, but you, you pay a professional. I do not go on my roof like my brother and put in the roofing materials, strip off the old roof, do all that work. I'm going to hire a pro. His opinion is it'll be done better by himself, but I believe in an attorney for an eviction is going to do a better job than I will. Although I was able to keep my house in custody of my kids without an attorney. Uh, we answered Jerry's question about the event. I got a quick thing here from Chester. Um, talk to an agent getting the ball rolling. Congratulations. It's a good start. It means that hopefully you're at the process, Chester, where you've got your savings figured out. You know how to improve that. You're working on your credit score. You've talked to a lender to find out what your options are. And now you're talking to agents. Uh, Sam Farr asked. Uh, he asked me uh, if, how do you manage contractors when you don't live in the same area? How do you check the quality of their work and their finishes? Good question. So um, previously, when I done my first two remodels, I used my property manager as sort of the general contractor of the project, the project manager. And she was the one checking the quality. Um, but then when we went out there and took a look at the property, you know, Dion found that the house that I'd completely remodeled and got an, a, a wonderful after repair value. The one thing they decided not to remodel in the house was to fix or replace the front door, which had a bullet hole in it. So, you know, there you go. <laughs> um, anyways, the quality in there was great. I'm not, I'm not digging, get, putting a dig at her. She did a great job of that, but it cost me 1500 bucks for her to manage the project. You know, 5% of the overall cost of the projects was they charged me. So how do I manage it from a distance? Well, I wanted to try to manage my first remodel, see if I could do it for a better price. And so far I'm crushing it. Now, the quality control aspect of it, first of all, I've directly talked with and met my GC, my general contractor guy. Um, He is beholden to me if he wants more work and if he wants access to my network. Plus, he came for me as a referral from my friend and now Dion and my friend Dominic, who has 67 rental properties. He doesn't do a good job for me. Guess what? Dominic's going to get ticked at him. Dominic lives there. Um, On top of that, I've said multiple times, I'm going to come and check the work at the end. Now, if you can't do that, that's fine. You could still say you're going to do it. You could still say I'm going to be there to check the work at the end. And then, oh, something came up. I won't be able to be there, unfortunately. And then the third and final thing is my real estate agent, who uh, Dion Metz names Angelo. I already had a conversation with him. Hey, man, if I pay you 150 bucks, will you swing by uh, at the, you know, certain part of each Process, part of the process and just do a quality check on the floor and quality check on the windows for me. An uninvolved, disinterested third party that has my interests at heart that I'm going to actually pay to drive out there and do a good job to look at something for me and then report back to me. All of that is significantly cheaper than paying an overall 5% management fee or just risking taking the risk that hopefully the contractor did a good job. So those are all the different ways you can manage that. I met Angela while I was there. Guy sharp. So if I invest in Gary, I will definitely be working with him. Yep. Um, there was a couple of questions here that came up. I saw Shred. Do you always provide washer and dryer, minor old, and wondering what to do during upcoming turnaround? So if you have a tenant turnover, it's different than if you have a tenant in place. If you have a tenant in place and you have a lease that says you provide a washer and dryer and they're old and they fail, I generally think it's your responsibility to replace them. They don't have to be new. You can find a scratch and dent in your area. There's there's like, for instance, there's one in Lakewood, Washington. It's actually literally a TV repair shop. That's a thing. Um, but they have several washers and dryers in store. They offer a one-year warranty with free delivery and pickup. So I've purchased a couple there because I had tenants in place whose lease included a washer and dryer. As long as those tenants are there, I'm going to continue that process. When I have a tenant turnover or I buy a property that doesn't have a tenant in place, I do not provide washers and dryers. I have in my shed, I have an old set of a washer and dryer that previous tenants left behind that tenants are welcome to use while they 
so they can move in without the added expense of moving in and then acquiring a washer and dryer. They can use my set, but it is not mine. It was a previous tenant's. I'm not going to maintain it. I'm not going to replace it. They're welcome to use it as long as they want until they get their own. Um, and most tenants within two or three months have acquired their own. So then that goes back into the shed, makes it easy to get tenants, but doesn't give me the added responsibility of maintaining a washer and dryer. So those are two things that I don't supply for my tenants. Mike, I think you don't reply like, refrigerator washer dryer like all like all, all that my appliances are on the tenant and that's the cultural norm for that area which is not how it is here in seattle in seattle i provide the washer dryer dishwasher refrigerator in indiana they bring all their own appliances so cool all right that's awesome uh, less things for me to have to fix and if that's the norm that's the norm kevin Couto. Howdy, Kevin. Do either of you guys use an assistant or VA for finding tenants? I'm looking for a tenant for my room rental and finding the messaging follow-up and tour scheduling exhausting. So I don't. Um, there's two different versions of the request in, in my head. The first one is I'm looking for a tenant for my room rental. So do you have a property with five rooms and you have five rooms that you're renting out and it's just a property with that maybe a VA can help with that because what a VA is best at is you put a system in place that has a logic tree that they follow if it's your property and you have a room that you're renting out to a roommate that you are going to be physically in the space with in the shared living areas I don't know that I would put a system in place where the VA got to screen that person I would want to have all of the interactions all the way through because from point of contact, you get to start to formulate an opinion of how professional a person is, how prompt they are, their communication style, and if you're going to want to live with that person or not. Um, so I don't, I can see a case for it if you were going to do rent by the room and you had a logic tree system that was, a, you know, you'd have to develop it for them to follow. Um, if you don't like dealing with messaging and follow up, a property manager would be to me the way to go. And some of them have a tenant placement fee, so then they do not get a continuing ongoing monthly payment. It could be half a month's rent or a full month's rent, whatever. It could be a flat rate. Maybe you hire a property manager to do that. I would have more luck with that than with a VA because a VA, when you hire a VA, generally you have to train them to do what you want to do. And, and the initial time to do that is going to be more than what it takes for you to find a tenant if it's just a room in your place. And you might change VAs in the future. What's your thoughts on that, Mike? Uh, my thoughts are I'll plagiarize from the lumberjack and this is directly from his course. So this is why you should go buy his course because it's fantastic. It does help you figure out how to manage a portfolio better. So what he does is he take, you know, he puts the ad for his unit out there, his expertly written ad. He gets inundated with, you know, usually around 50 different people interested in seeing the property. Now, rather than schedule somebody to go out there and meet with all these people at different times, he says, okay, this Saturday, we're going to have an open house for the property. If you want to see it, you got to be there this Saturday. And people who are serious about it, which is who you want, will make it happen. Then he pays a real estate agent by the hour. He doesn't pay them the first, the first month's rent. That first month's rent's like 2000 bucks. He pays the real estate agent by the hour to just go sit there like they would any other open house, except any other open house, they're not getting paid by the hour. Can't remember what his hourly rate, hourly rate is. I think it's like 35 bucks an hour he pays to some young 25 year old who everybody's happy to see. And she sits there, answers whatever questions that she needs. She's familiar with him and his process so that she can relay information that he would need relayed to the prospective tenants. And he says so far, you know, maybe that person does two or three open houses over a month and he pays 100 to 150 bucks per session. He ends up paying about $550 to get the place leased instead of instead of $2,000 a month to your freaking property manager who's going to charge you the first month's rent or to a real estate agent who's going to take that as a commission on the first month's rent. So that information, that little cheat, that little hack can be found in his course and is one of the many ways that that thing pays for itself a hundred times over. Also by Dion's course, sorry. <laughs> That's all good. Um, a couple more questions and we'll be wrapping up here. Cody Knight asks a question. So howdy, Cody. I have $60,000 of a HELOC left to pay. I also have $40,000 from a stock brokerage account. Any thoughts on selling my stocks to pay down my HELOC so that I can buy my next rental property? I do have some thoughts. So the, the first process, the first question, anytime we're going to use a HELOC, cash out refinance or second mortgage or sell to 1031 is, are you going to be able to find 
deals that justify the added debt on the existing more and the existing asset. So when you use the HELOC, let's say it was paid off completely. If you use the HELOC to buy the next property, which is probably going to also have debt. So your HELOC is the down payment in some cases, unless you're investing in Gary, Indiana, where that HELOC might be the purchase and the rehab, and then you got to pay it off. So you need to know your specifics there. Is the deal good enough to justify the, the added debt on your house or your, or your asset that you're putting that on there? But if you go to sell the stocks, how, um, what type of, there's different, it's the same stock, but there's a different way of looking at it. Have you owned it long enough for it to be capital gains? What is the gap between the purchase price of the stocks, your, your floor, and when you sell, how much taxes are you going to have out of that 40,000? There will be a taxable event somewhere in there, unless you've lost money. Um, when, because it's not, you can't 1031 exchange, exchange the sale of stocks to buy real estate. It has to be like for like, right? You can sell real estate to buy real estate. Um, but you can't sell stocks to buy real estate without and then 1031 exchange again. So do the math on how much you're going to be paying in taxes. I hate to give this as advice because I don't ever want to say stocks are bad or real estate is bad or good or, or running a business is good or bad because it's, it's definitely unique to the individual. What excites you, you're more likely to stick to when there's a problem. Stocks don't excite me. So if somebody were to at any point give me stocks, I would immediately sell, pay whatever gains or taxes there was. Even if it was, if I owned it for less than a year and I'd be paying income gains on it, I would sell it, take it, put the money to work in real estate. But that's because real estate excites me, stocks don't. If stocks excite you and real estate doesn't, and you sell the stocks and get into real estate and you have your first headache, your first challenge, your first lawsuit, your first eviction, your first whatever, maybe not. But if you're like me, and I would rather have a lawsuit and an eviction than to ever look at a stock chart and think, oh, I might have made money in theory in this magical made up thing that can drop to zero at any point in time, because it's something a CEO does that I don't know who he is, right? Like that's, or she is, that, that's, that's not the way I ever want to live my life. I want a place where if it even burns to the ground, the insurance is going to pay the mortgage off, the insurance is going to give me a bunch of money, I could clear it off and sell the land and walk away with money. That, that excites me. Um, Mike, thoughts on... Selling stocks to pay off a HELOC to buy properties. So I'm about to release a video that takes you through A to Z on how you can use a HELOC to invest in real estate because I've done it for my last four deals um, and there's a bunch of different ways to do it. So that video is going to come out on my channel soon. Feel free to check that out. Um, now, this is a very unique question and we're in an extremely unique time. And the Lumberjack and I have had a couple of conversations recently on YouTube live streams over the last couple of weeks, where we talked about the fact that when banks tighten credit and tighten lending restrictions, one of the first things that happens is they close home equity lines of credit that are unused because it's a non-performing loan. They have to allocate the money to lend to you for that HELOC account. But if you don't draw it out, they're stuck with this pile of money that they have to keep here for you, but they're not making money on it. So they'll close your account and lend it to someone who's actually going to pay them interest on it. Now, this is what convinces me that Bigger Pockets must watch our channels because, like, we have this conversation two weeks in a row, and then the next week they do an entire special on it. And that is like the 50th time, like the time I made the REI Avengers thing with you, me, Zuber, and Matt, and I photoshopped our faces onto it. And then two weeks later, they did the same freaking thing. Come up with your own ideas, you bums. Anyways, sorry, that's me on my soapbox. But the highest form of compliment, yeah, is copying. Yeah. Okay, tell that tell that to that property management service that that took your binder strategy idea with no credit for your ideas. Anyway, moral, moral of the story is: let's use that to buy real estate. What happens when two weeks later that HELOC gets closed by your bank because it's tightening up? I just lost this tool that I needed to do work on my real estate portfolio. It's going to be very frustrating, um, Matt much to my dismay, as frustrated as I am with him, the lumberjack was like, look, buddy, during the 2007, 2008 recession, I had a HELOC. I only took out $60,000. I could have taken out 120. I didn't. I took out the 60. They closed the other 60. And to this day, I wish I'd taken out the full amount. And I'm sitting there mad because I don't want to pay the interest only payment on 125,000 bucks when the 125,000 bucks isn't even being invested. But he's like, it's a tool. It's a tool. Do you want the tool? Yes or no? If you don't take the tool now, the tool might not be there tomorrow. Now, this is not meant as financial advice for everyone watching to go sprint to your banks and withdraw your HELOCs all the way down to the max amount. But what I'm saying is, here's your history lesson. Here's what's happened in the past. 
For me, I have used the tool successfully multiple times in a row now, and I don't want my tool to be taken away from me. So as frustrating as it is, I'm paying to rent my tool out, even though I'm not using it to its fullest capacity yet, because I trust Matt, even though he pisses me off. I trust him and he's right. So yes, uh, would, I, would, I would I use stocks to pay off that HELOC specifically if I don't have another deal immediately in mind? If you're just going to leave a HELOC undrawn, completely paid off, uh, I mean, there's a chance it could be closed. It might be better just to leave it in stocks, but I am very pro HELOC investing. Okay, I think we are through the questions, unless you see any others that pop up. I think there was a question here at the bottom from Chester. Millennial Mike, when is your course on investing at a distance coming out? Uh, well, my battery on my camera is about to die, so... Uh, you just have to, you just have to, I'm going to keep you guys guessing. I don't know. could be, could be in a couple weeks, could be in a couple months. Maybe I'll bounce from YouTube altogether and you'll never hear from me again. <laughs> I'm sure that's likely. Right. Uh, Ryan, howdy. I'm about to close on a he loan intending on paying off a second property. Should I keep the debt and invest the cash? Invest the cash. What is the interest rate on the HELOC? When does the rate adjust? Um, can you find a deal that can justify leaving the debt on the existing asset? There's a couple of things to look at there. Um, it usually comes down to, can you find a deal? And that doesn't mean, I think I would find, I mean, you know there's a deal that if you made an offer, it's more likely, more than likely that you are not going to be outbid by the first, you know, the next 20 people who offer over asking, waiving contingencies. Um, and you would actually likely get the deal then I, I prefer putting money to work than paying off debt unless your HELOC is in any way close to where the rate is going to adjust before you could pay off the remaining balance. Buddies, suggestions when the only deals are showing up in bad areas, I could manage them no problem, but I'm not sure if it's worth the headache of the type of tenant the bad areas attract. If you can't go there safely to collect your rents and you're not comfortable sending a property manager there without an armed escort to collect the rents, I wouldn't want to invest there. Sometimes the best yield math numbers is in the war zones in the, in the really dangerous places. Uh, so I would not lower the type of property that I was investing in unless that was my strategy from the start. If you're buying eight houses on a street with 10 to turn and flip and repair them all and get better tenants in each one, and you're going to you have the resources to flip the entire street? Maybe. If you had the five to 10 years too, to stabilize and get a complete tenant switch over going on there, two years maybe. Um, but no, kind of like if you invest in Gary, Indiana, I, I went there with Mike and we took you know a week and traveled around and met every rude waiter and waitress that I think exist in that state. But we looked and one of the takeaways was don't look at a property listing and make an offer without, if you're investing in an area like Gary at a distance where you're not there, without somebody having somebody that you trust, your property manager, your contractor, your agent, or your cousin who works in the industry somehow, somebody that you trust, going to the street and taking their phone and recording up one side and down the other to see how many abandoned houses there were. Because there could be two streets right next to each other where one is great to invest on and one you don't want to invest on unless you can buy eight of those houses all at once and flip all of them and have the resources to do all the repairs to eight um, because of how different one street over could be. And we got your battery switched out. Yep. What would it take to get a cord that made that permanent? Uh, you know, I could probably go by. Honestly, I just need to buy a new camera because this one downgrades the footage when I plug it in and live stream it. I'd rather buy one that doesn't and just get a new one, but I haven't had a need to. And I don't mind doing a random battery swap an hour and a half into a live stream. I really don't think that's going to affect the viewers. <laughs> there was a follow-up to Ryan here. I want to use the second property as collateral on a new loan. Right, right. So when so you want to buy the next property with a loan, but use the HELOC to get it. So you have added debt on this asset. Yeah. I don't know. There's there's a lot of nuances there. Yes, finding all the rude people. It was the the average person in Portugal is as rude as the average wait staff in Gary. It's like a perfect analogy. 
And I think a good point to wrap up for the night, um, for the day, whatever it is where you're at, it's two o'clock in the morning here. So, um, which is, this is the first time I don't hear the church bells going because every square in this place has a church where um, my brother keeps trying to get pictures of me in a church saying, look, you didn't burst into flames. But um, <laughs> thank you all very much for the questions. This has been awesome. Millennial Mike, how can people find you if they want to reach out? Oh, I left my YouTube channel in the live chat, but yeah, just type in Millennial Mike on YouTube and Instagram and I will pop up and or TikTok. I finally made one. Cool. Nice. I think I have one of those coming up. We'll probably get those going just before it gets banned in the U S be perfect. Nice. Um, you can find information about me at deontalk.com. There's information on there on how to book an hour. If you want a one-on-one -on -one zoom call, there is, uh, the free binder course. You can actually get the entire course in, in uh, curriculum format on how to use the binder strategy. You can email me at dion at deontalks.com or deontalk.com. And I would really like it if you could email me your binder success stories. Your, what were the numbers when you started? What number did you expect? What number did the tenants suggest? How did you settle it? Um, in that course, there is how to use it with property management, how to use it at a with the Section 8 program, I have another video that's coming out being added to the course on how what to do if the tenants suggest a number too small for your liking. Um, so literally what to do when that happens. Um, I want to thank everybody for hanging out with us tonight. It's been awesome. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Hopefully this information helps somebody, maybe two somebodies. Until my next video, thanks for coming to my Dion talk. <laughs>